Welcome back to Storytellers Behind the Scenes. Thanks for joining me today. I am thrilled to introduce you to my very, very dear friend, Marianne Vogelbender, who is a producer, director, writer extraordinaire, who most recently just finished a 20 year stint at the Dr. Phil Show. She's got some amazing stories to share and so much knowledge that I'm sure you're gonna be interested in everything that she has to say. So sit back, grab a drink, and enjoy. Welcome, Marianne. We're so happy to have you here. Thank you, Jody. It's so great to be here. It's so funny to have you call me Marianne because you always call me Mav, but I will take Marianne or Mav. <laughs> uh, it's true. I mean, I have a lot of names for you. Mayor, Mav, Marianne. I, I'm, I don't know. We'll have to come up with some more. <laughs> so Marianne, like many of my guests, is a wonderful friend who I met at Banyan Productions, which to the listeners of Storytellers Behind the Scenes, it's no surprise. Marianne, you and I have been friends for, gosh, at least 24 or 25 years, right? Because Ethan is 23. Yeah, I would say, yeah, a hard 25. Yes. It's insane. Because <laughs> we, we look fabulous. Exactly. We, look we just fabulous. have glasses. That's the only difference. <laughs> we have glasses and I have a 23-year-old and a 21-year-old. And you have a 23-year-old, yeah. Right? But <laughs> hey, I could still be 30. I think, you know, whatever. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I, I feel young. That's the main thing. I honestly feel that being in this business to some level, and you could, I'd love your opinion on this. I feel that it has kept me younger. I don't know if it's the hours on your feet, the constant thought process of what's next and being prepared. What do you think about that? Do you feel uh, like in your mind, you're younger than your age? A hundred percent. And I do think that it's a lot of the business. I think it's because in our business, we have to pivot all the time. You know, we are chameleons. You know, we literally have to pivot all the time to the situation that we're in. So we're never just clocking in, you know, making the widgets and leaving, right? Uh, and, and that's why we love it too. But certainly that keeps us young. That keeps us having to keep on the pulse of what's going on um, just because we need to know what's going on and we want to know what's going on, right? We don't know what we want to know, what stories are trending, what people are talking about. All that kind of stuff. Like we want to know. So I yeah, love that. Just, You're yeah, right. The idea, and that is such a good point. And we're going to go backwards on this because I, I really want to stick with this because each of our episodes, I try to talk about a specific point and it usually will pop out during the conversation. Your comment about being a chameleon is so spot on. We are asked to go into certain situations uh, or many situations that may be uncomfortable, even environments we've never been in before. And we're expected to fit in all the time. Talk about that a little bit in your life and how that has uh, transformed the way you think about your job. I think I've always been interested in what other people are doing. You know, whether it was the guy who was shelving, you know, food at the grocery store to the person who was on the radio station. Like, I always wanted to know what it was like to be in anybody else's shoes. That was always so interesting to me, even as a kid. I always wanted to, like, peer back behind and be like, what's he doing? You know, it was just natural curiosity, I'm sure. Um, but how that has developed into, you know, you know, a career wise it, it, for me is, I mean, literally, I need to pivot from spending a day with Gary Busey to then literally the next day I could be talking to a woman who had just lost her daughter to suicide. And then the next day I'm interviewing Cher. And then the next day I'm buying foot cream for one of my cast members who has a foot uh, disease. Like, it's just, you have to just like wear these different hats and pivot and, and, um, it's kind of, it makes it, it makes it, uh, there's a little bit of anxiety there, I think, that can go with that because you literally never know what's going to be thrown at you, which it maybe could be another, you know, a second topic here, which is about being a problem solver. You're right. solving problems. So like, literally, like being a field producer, director, most of your job is you're solving problems. 
obstacles get thrown at you right and you're going like okay we can't shoot here now oh this person's sick oh oh the guest doesn't want to do the show you know constant movement Mm -hmm. you're on your feet and and in your mind you're constantly thinking it's right and so you just have to pivot but certainly the chameleon part i i've struggled with it a little bit only because i always wanted to make sure that i'm i'm being sincere you know when you're chameleon you know you kind of get the sense of like oh well do they really think that i believe that you know i'm sitting in front of this person who's an extreme you know right person you know i i I, one of my last interviews for dr phil was uh one of the proud boys for example oh wow we're reformed but right a member of the proud boys so like you know, I have to sit and I, I, I'm not going to pretend that I agree with what he's saying, right? Or or right. what he believed in. But like, you have to somehow gain that belief or that, you know, that, that uh, you have to well, you somehow have to gain some common tr- ground. Right. Yeah. And you have to certainly do your best to have an open mind, right? As journalists, yeah, we're mind. not supposed to inject our own opinion, right? As a right. journalist to begin right. with. Right. So that's important. And I often a lot of the say stories... to people like, I don't know, like, I don't know what you know. So, so, so explain it to me. Like it's, I want to know your side. I want to know what you're experiencing. You know, I'll be the first to admit, I don't know what it feels like to lose a child to suicide. I don't know. You know, there's, there's right. I don't know what that feels like. Um, but somehow uh, I have to get them to want to tell me, you know, and so, get them yeah. to feel safe in your conversation. So I'm going to roll back. You had an interesting path as a kid. You grew up and you decided or you had a calling to speak French. You were in high school in Bucks County. Is that true? Yep. And then New Hope, you... New Hope Silbury High School. Wow. Was that big back then? Because it was tiny. A t- it it really... still is. There was 48 people in my graduating class. Wow tiny private public school not private you know but it was just a small community yeah so you you fell in love with the french language and i'm well, guessing the french culture well you know what's really funny i have to back up for a second i didn't my fascination with going to, yes i spent my my junior year of high school in france um but i didn't i well, i wasn't compelled to go to france i was just compelled to do something different I was sick oh. of American public school uh, uh, life or uh, just just American teenage life. I want to do something different. I was bored and I That's looked at ballsy, the- by the way. That's ballsy. Uh, yeah. And, um, you know, I, my family had come from Europe. They'd come from Germany, whatever. So I had a little bit of a European thought in my mind. I had never been there. But and I want so I thought, you know what? I want to go abroad. I want to go abroad for the year. And when I looked into the program, you needed two years of a language to go abroad. And the only mm. language I had offered in school, the only options were French and German, and I had taken French. So the only place I could have gone was either England or France. And I, I would have, honestly, I mean, I often say, like, if I would have spoke German, I would have gone to Germany. I would have, because that was just my heritage, and uh, I would have. But, I, but I, I, I couldn't. So I went to France with two years of French, which is like two weeks of French. Anyway, so I went to France and um, and then fell in love with French, you know, and Got then it. fell in love with the French culture. So how did that all work for you? You just said, OK, I'm going to go to France for a it year. It was pretty nuts. I'll be honest. I was the only person in my entire school that did it and never did do it. Um, I was the only person wow. I knew that ever did it. Um, my parents were like, what do you want to do? Oh, my God. Um, I think I was somewhat lucky that they had recently divorced so like I had the one against the other and I could kind of uh, talk into what I wanted to do <laughs> well dad said were you like that. 17 16 in fact when I made the decision I was 15 I I went there four days after my 16th birthday so when I was doing all their interviewing and everything they come they interview you to make sure that you know I guess you're stable enough and um and then um you know you go there and they match you with a french family and i lived uh, i mean i could spend a podcast on this but i lived for a year with this french family in a a, a fairly small town about 50,000 people in um brittany in on the coast right on the coast of in the on the english channel my bedroom was literally like i walked out the screen door and i walked five steps and jumped i'd be in the english channel and i'm likely to say to this day it's it's been for uh, 30 five years um I just spent three weeks with them last summer and I'm still very very close to the whole family 
And um, they're like my French sister and brother and French mother. My French father's passed away. So um, yeah, it, it just, it woke me up to the world, right? Here I am, this very, uh, you know, this just white American in this small little town in Pennsylvania. And it just like went like, made me go like, you know. Now the, you weren't fluent when you went there. How long did it I take you to become fluent? I barely knew B or no. Like, uh, ça va was probably the most. Yeah, nothing, <laughs> nothing, nothing, nothing. Yeah, not, not, not the greatest. I wouldn't necessarily recommend falling in that way but um you know i struggled it was i definitely struggled the first six months um i cried i was homesick and then of course you know by the time the year was up my mother literally had to come and bring me home like she literally had to come and say you're coming back to america how do you think that allowed you to form yourself as um a more aware person on this planet Oh, I think that um, so many reasons, so many ways, but I, I think that um, when you're in a situation like that, especially when you have a language barrier, you have to find a way to uh, communicate. And so you have to put yourself out there. You have to um, not worry about being um, made fun of. I mean, not, you know, made fun of, but, you know, just uh, because you're going to, you're going to fumble your way through everything. So um, I guess it made me even more courageous to say like, I want, cause I wanted to meet these kids. I wanted to, you know, I wanted to learn about them and, and, and yet doing that was frightening, you know, because I couldn't really speak. And right. so, um, you know, you, you get, you, you know, you find one or two people that can speak English and then, you know, you certainly learn, but I was always, um, I had to really I had to not worry about if I was going to be like laughed at, I guess, you know, or I had to just say like, I, I have to do this, like to survive. I had to go every day to school there, to the high school there and try to learn and try to make friends. And, you know, um, and I had a lot of help and my family was great, you know, my French family. Um, but it, it made me realize that I had to, I guess it gave me like empathy too. You know, right. for, for people even in, you know, who, who, who had a handicap because this was a handicap in that sense, you know, I, I couldn't speak the language, yeah. you know, so I, I you know, I, I guess it, it's always made me kind of, you know, uh, uh, understand that, you know, people, um, we all have, you know, issues and things that we're, you know, afraid of and challenges. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. That we're, we're, we're not the best at, you know, and um, you got to just keep going. It's certainly you know? a great way to build your confidence, right? Or crush it, I guess. But in your yeah. sense, it, yeah, it's certainly... I mean, you you become very self-reliant. Like you realize you're, you know, your mom's not going to do this for you. Your dad's not like, they're not around. No one's around. Your sister's not right. around. No one, no one gives you, doesn't care anything about you really. It made me really try to like, it kind of was like, I, I had a new start. I guess it's for people like people who go to new high schools. It can be similar or whatever, where mm -hmm. all of a sudden I could be a different person if I wanted to be. I right. wasn't, you know, um, and. How did um, that prepare you for college? Did it prepare? So you came home, you finished your senior year. And obviously you had probably changed a great deal. Maybe your hairstyle, your, your style in general being over there. But did it prepare you to move forward? and and did it did it influence where you went to college or anything like that i it definitely changed me as a person I mean, my mother would say 180 degrees it flipped me because i kind of went as a very selfish 16 year old american girl and came back uh very appreciative of uh, my family my friends my home my privilege I guess the only thing it did for me is it did make me realize that I didn't want to be in this bubble of this small school. So I didn't want to go to a small college or I didn't want to go to a, you know, I wanted to like, I wanted to like go to like something big. So I did my first year of college. I actually went to the university of Delaware and um, because it was a really big school. And I was like, this is going to be great. I'm going to meet people from everywhere. And then I realized I'm just meeting people from New Jersey and Delaware. <laughs> And it didn't work. It didn't work. And I, I, I pivoted and I reapplied for schools again. Oh, God help my mother. And got, you know, transferred schools, transferred to a smaller school, uh, Vassar College in upstate New York, which, although was small, did have people from all over the country and all over the world. 
So right. I found what I was looking for, but not through numbers, I guess, but through kind of like just a different experience, you know. What was your major there? I don't I remember. was a sociology major. And the reason why I was sociology major is like you can say a lot of things about Vassar College, but one of them is not going to be that it's a communication school. You know, it's not. It didn't have a communications department. All I knew is that um, I liked telling stories and I was trying to figure out how to do that in um, and somehow work in some kind of production. So sociology was literally I chose this major because it was the only major that allowed me to do internships in the field I thought I wanted to go in. So my first internship there, junior year, I think it was junior, sophomore maybe, was I sophomore. I interned for a local video production company. And so you knew back then you wanted to go into production. I I was it yeah, I was kind of intrigued by the glamour at that point, the glamour of production, right? I was kind of like, ooh, this is kind of cool. What's going on? Glamour. Here? Yeah, the glamour. <laughs> Um, not the 18 yeah. hour work days or 20 hour work. Days. Right. Right. Yeah. No, no, yeah, no, that never happened. Um, yeah. The lights and the, I was, yeah, I was kind of intrigued. Like what is, you know, what is, what is this all about? You know? And, um, you know, they were doing local Cadillac commercials, you know, where they would put us in as like the customers or, you know, um, right. they, you know, they were, you know, shooting little infomercials and things. But, you know, I was finally and they had an audio. I remember that the top was the video and the downstairs was the audio and they had a full uh, one inch track audio uh, place for for musicians, for bands. And I would go on Saturdays while they were, you know, uh, taping some, you know, uh, recording some band and stuff and like, help the tech engineer and get coffee and stuff like that. And I just thought it was the shit, you know, like, I thought it was the coolest thing ever. Um, so that's why I took the sociology degree, honestly. Um, it was because it allowed me to do that. But when I left, I don't know, I'll end it there. Yeah. So it was a social and a French minor. I was always doing French. I went back to France my junior year. But it was always sociology because I worked at the Hudson Valley Magazine. I worked for the um, the local newspaper there in Poughkeepsie. Um, I was I was I was like trying to figure out how to get in that world of media, you know. So early on, you got the bug. You were interested. Yeah. So when you were at school, did you have any influencers in your life at that point? You know, I really didn't. I didn't. Wow. At the, oh, no, I didn't at all. I really didn't know anybody who did this. The only thing I did know uh, was that my dad, see, my dad was an art director in, in the advertising business. He was a madman. He was an art director in New York during, during the madman era. And so I knew that part kind of, which, you know, morphed a little bit into, mm -hmm. you know, television production. And I, so I was intrigued by that. And I actually thought I would go into that. And he had me, you know, like he would let me meet some of his friends and I would go into the office and kind of see what they're doing on a day to day. <clears throat> he did not want me to go into that. That was not something he thought was, I don't know. I don't feel like he thought it was worthy or so, but he allowed me to, you know, play around and stuff. But um, that was it. Other than that, no, I, I didn't have any influence per you know yeah i didn't not certainly not at school mm -mm. so once you graduated where did you go well i was one of those kids that was like well i went to college now i got to get a job so i and i thought i needed to get a job even before i graduated so they had all these job fairs and i went up for all these job fairs and i i, I applied to things like marriott hotels and i did apply for a couple advertising agencies um and I applied for a company, uh, an intercultural communications company, because I was bilingual in French. So I said, well, maybe I can use the French. So I landed a job um, before I was even, you know, got my diploma. I had a job um, in Philly Incredible. To, for this company called Inlingua as uh, one of their consultants uh, doing translation, interpretive services, handling things like that. So I left. I took three weeks between when I graduated and when I started working. And I immediately went to a nine to five pantyhose job in downtown Philly, Broad and Locust, the corner of Broad. Oh, okay. Locust. Yeah. And I worked for two years for this company called Inlingua. Okay. And I love, I have to stop you for a second. Oh. You called it a pantyhose job? It was a pantyhose that, job. It was the can job. Can describe? <laughs> sure. It was a job. Some people that, don't know what pantyhose <laughs> are. <laughs> That's a good point. <laughs> I always think of it as my pantyhose job because it was literally the job where I had to like, I went and I bought like two 
and tailor suits <laughs> and one was tan and one was black and i basically you know wore them with a different shirt like every day and I had to wear like nice shoes and like pantyhose with a skirt. Like you weren't right. going to wear a skirt without pantyhose. Right. And I went to this corporate, corporate office. Um, and I hated it. <laughs> I mean, I hated that part of it. I hated that I had to dress up to be somebody I didn't really think I was. Right. Yeah. But did you learn something from that job? Yes. That job ultimately got me into realizing I want to be in production. And that specific job, and maybe every job would have led there, I don't know. But after a year and a half, I started working for the translation team. And the translation team needed to translate um, infomercials into different languages and um, create commercials for the French-Canadian market and um, do, th do, yeah, things like that. And so I started working with local production companies in Philly to do the voiceovers and the recordings and stuff. And I would sit there in these, you know, these audio booths with the the audio engineer and the and the French, I mean, or the French, the Spanish, you know, interpreter, and I just loved it. You know, I loved all the different dials and all. And at the time, I was working at a place, and you're going to help me remember what it's called, but it was it's called Telenium now, if it's still in business. But it was way out in Primo. E.J. Stewart. That yeah. was my first e. job. Stewart. It may have been it Stewart was, Digital when you went there. Yes, it was Stewart Digital, and. And they had a huge, they had a soundstage, right? And the sound huge. Stage, huge. And I remember I would sneak down the hallway from the, you know, I'd like grab a little something to eat. And I'd sneak down the hallway and like open the door to the soundstage. Yeah. And they were doing like some video in there. And I was like, yeah. we do it, right? And I was like, this is the big time, you know, like <laughs> this is what I want to do. So, um, you know, I decided I wasn't going to get there doing what I was doing. So I um, completely crashed like 180 it i i quit my job like I, just like that you just quit i was having a like a midlife crisis at 23 i was <laughs> in a relationship i hated i had taken a one week uh motorcycle trip with a friend down skyline drive and in the rain when i ask you and i got back from that and i said i'm changing my whole life I'm leaving Philly. I'm moving back home. I'm leaving my job. I'm leaving my boyfriend. And it all happened within a week or two. And I moved back home and I had a dear friend back in New Hope whose family owned a bar. And she said, Marianne, we need someone for Thursday and Saturday and Sunday shifts. And I said, I'm in. <laughs> and I left my pantyhose job and I went working literally at what I would describe as a live music uh, gay biker bar in new I hope for it. two years it's called john and peter's still there they just had their i've been there anniversary. you've been there yeah and i you know i like just eh, i stopped the whole pantyhose job and i said i want to do something different and actually so then i knew i really wanted to work in production but i didn't really have the skills like i didn't really know the audio and the video so I the kudos to Jill Biden because I went back to school and went to a local community college. I went to Bucks County Community College and I took audio classes and video classes and journalism Amazing. classes. Wait, is and, that the one near Tyler State Park in Bucks County? Mm -hmm, yeah. I had no idea they even have communication classes mm -hmm, there. Mm -hmm. I know my and, and because of the the kind of uh, where they sit between New York and Philly, it was like my journalism professor was like a writer at the New York Times, and he just Amazing. did. You know, and so I started to learn a lot more about oh, okay, like this is how you turn a camera on, and this is what a wide shot is, and all that kind of stuff. So even though I had this amazing, uh, you know, vaster career or whatever, I, it really was community college <laughs> that taught me how to you know, be hands on, like what a speaker does and how to use a microphone and all that. And, um, and then from there, I started to do a documentary. I wanted to do a documentary on my parents' farm, which is another hour, uh, podcast. So, um, a tree I, farm. Uh, yeah, they have a Christmas tree farm that is also a national historic landmark. And I wanted to do a, 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 a you know, a, a documentary about it. So my mother said, well, I know a great guy who has a local production company and he's a, a, conser a conservationist and into nature and stuff. And maybe he can help you. So here, here's his number, call him. Maybe he can help you, you know, with, you know, give you a camera or something. So I call him and his name was Rob and I met him 
And we became fast friends and he helped me make the documentary, which ultimately took three or four years. Um, and now he's my husband. <laughs> <laughs> I just so, got chills, okay? <laughs> you know that I don't know that story? I knew that you met Rob through the business. I had no idea that your mother connected you with Rob. She did. That is incredible. I know. And, and your because- husband's a talented writer, producer, shooter, director, songwriter, mm-hmm. songwriter editor. And he, and even a little more uh, drilled down on that, the one, because I wanted to do this documentary about the, my parents' farm, which is this National Historic Landmark, when I reached out to Rob, he had actually, several years before, had tried to do the same thing. Wow. And so when I said I wanted to do it, he was like, I've been trying to do that too. So about your farm? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, Oh, yeah. Because it was, it's a pretty amazing. Yes. And um, he was trying to do it for the Audubon Society that was there running the Environmental Education Center. He was trying to do it as a historical thing. And he had found 35 millimeter footage at the Library of Congress of when they dedicated the farm in the 50s with the, you know, the head of the the interior, interior department, secretary of interior was at the farm to give the plaque and all that. So um, anyway, so uh, yeah, so I I, I blame my mother for (laughs) for introducing to my husband. and Rob um, Bender, Rob Bender, Rob Bender, I should Look say, him yep. up in his music, <laughs> Rob Bender music.com. If you want to hear Rob's music. Um, but, um, yeah, my mind is blown right now. Okay. And, okay. and then, you know, we met and, uh, seven years later we got married on the farm. Amazing. I remember And my that. mom still lives there right now. So that was a sweet kind of chapter in my life. Your mom is amazing. Well, she did not introduce us as any kind of love interest. I know, I know that. But the fact that she was so supportive early on, you left your job, you didn't have another job, and she supported your ideal and your idea of what you wanted to do, which I love. And of course, you know, I love your mom. But I think think that's She just wanted me to be happy and she knew I wasn't. And but she I'll knew tell you, that I'll that tell point, you, she still made me pay $50 a week to live in the house. I was 23. Good for her. She said, you can move home, but you're going to pay something. So I paid $50 a week to live at her home. I had to have a job. I actually got a second job. So I waitressed at a French restaurant and bartended. And so I had, I worked four or five nights a week and then went to school um, for a couple of years. So she always, Amazing. you know, she always said, listen, we, you know, I'll help you, but you have to, you know, you can't sleep in till noon every day. Right. You, you, to, need, you need to hold, right. Yeah. Exactly. You need to be part of the equation. Right. You're not having it handed to you in a silver right. platter. Right. So how did you get from that early documentary experience? How did you get to Banyan? So Banyan, right? So I was, so I was at that stage where I had finished the documentary. I was, you know, had finished my schooling at Bucks County Community College, <clears throat> still working at the bars. Um, and um, I just started calling companies. Honestly, I started just looking at production companies. There was some kind of like Los Angeles, I mean, Los Angeles, um, Philadelphia film guide or something, film and TV guide. And I literally yes. would just start like calling companies. <laughs> And say, I, hear you. Like, I did the I'm same in, thing. <laughs> right. I'm like, I, I, I just, I'm interested in, I, you know, I'd love to intern for you. I'd love to production assistant. Uh, Rob, like I said, had had, um, I should mention that too. You know, he had his own production company and he was doing yeah. a lot of uh, corporate clients. So I would right. go out with him and, you know, I'd run his audio with him or I'd be the interviewer while he was shooting or whatever. So I got, I was getting more and more experience. So I had a little bit of experience, you know, right. um, at the time. And I landed on a phone call with Chris Emanuelides. Was he in charge of programming at the time? No. He was just, not just, but he was the executive producer of a show on TLC called Reunion. Oh. At the time. So he had already been on Travelers. Yes. Right? Yes. And then he went to Reunion. Yes. Travelers had just. That Reunion was your first. That was my first, first show. And, right. And I just talked to him and he, he said, well, uh, I actually do need like a researcher person to come in and help us book stories. And I said, great. And I went down and I interviewed with him and, you know, luckily got the down. job. You went down. I, I went down to Philly. Arch. 
I went and we all feel like we're down in to the, the basement. basement. <laughs> right, to the basement. Because honestly, up, even up until three months ago, you know, Dr. Phil, we always work in basements, right? We're always in the basement. Got to work in that basement. I don't know why. We're always in the basement. Um, <clears throat> or in a room without a window somehow. Um, yeah. We and I got the, the job basement. and I started working at Banyan. And that's when I met And that's you. where I met you. And that's when I met Barbara Alfano. And I met so many wonderful people. And it was just the most amazing, incredible environment for five years for me to learn, to go from this entry level position, five years at the end of it, I was, you know, I was producing in the field. I was line producing on Epicurious in the truck. I was, you know, I had learned so much. And I, I tell which people- shows did you work on? Tell me which shows you worked on. So you started I on did, Reunion. I did Reunion. Then I think I did Baby Story then. Then I did Wedding Story for a hot second. Then I did Trading Spaces Girls versus Boys. And then I did Epicurious, I believe. I think that was it. No, Makeover Story. There was Makeover Story. Ah. Another huge one. Another huge one. That was a huge oh one. Oh my gosh. First of all, the Makeover <laughs> Story. Not Ambush Makeover? No, no. That was later. This is still Makeover Story. Right. Uh, for TLC. Yeah. Right. right. Yeah. We did all yeah. those, those story shows. Yeah. All and I remember because when you were at reunion, I was on a, working on a wedding story. Yeah. So I that... remember you coming over to me saying you were adopted, right? Would you like to be reunited <laughs> with your family? I just remember. I'm like, really? no, thank you. I'm not doing that. <laughs> what? Well, I had no idea. Yeah. I mean, we no, were already I, friendly I at that point. I don't remember. <laughs> yeah. We were already friendly that at that point. Was that, like, no. was that probably rude for me to let me like, you're yeah, no. right? Listen, <laughs> when I was working on a wedding story and then was the EP uh, and I was, you know, seven months pregnant, we were now upstairs in an apartment yes. in that same building. Yes. And in the room beside our wedding story office was the logging room. Okay. And baby story was in there uh, logging and you'd hear women screaming and crying while they're having uh, babies. And people uh, would come over to me and say, do you want to be on a baby story? I'm like, oh, uh, hell no. Uh, I'm not showing like, myself. I'm not even sure I don't have the baby now. <laughs> oh but I do. Gosh. Yeah. No, people would always say, well, would you, what about your wedding? When Daryl and I were getting married, why don't you? Why are you featured hey. on a wedding story? And like, we were not always a desperate. Chance. We were always desperate for finding stories. But I'll not actually, you know, it's funny that we bring up baby story because I will say that that's one of the pivotal moments in my career where I really realized what I was doing was impacting people's lives or being part of people's lives because I had a couple who were having their second child and she went into labor and I went and drove to the house. It was, you know, two o'clock in the morning, drove the house in like an ice storm, got the husband filming by myself in the car, went to the hospital with him, um, you know, got there and it was a very complicated birth. And uh, we got to the point where she, it was very close call and they had to emergency C-section her. We're now all in the, now we're in the OR, you know, full scrubs in the OR with her and the baby comes out gray. Mm. And the the physician who was amazing, a female uh, surgeon, said, camera's off the table. I still get chills. I just get chills in my head. I got chills, too. And that was the first time where I thought to myself, holy shit, this isn't a fucking television show. Right. This is someone's life, you know, like, holy yeah. shit. And it's the first time where you realize that. And also, uh, but am I going to turn the cameras off? You know, like, I mean, there is that part of me, like, am I going to, so she did say cameras off the table. She didn't say cameras off. <laughs> so I had my camera guy, who was Boris, at the time, Boris Romanenko, who, if you're out there, Boris, contact me, because I can't find you and it's driving me crazy. Um, he went out the door and started filming through the window. I was in second camera and I was crouched down in the room. So I just decided to keep the camera rolling and just sit back. And luckily, God bless, the baby was absolutely fine. Uh, and you know, bouncing boy. Um, it's weird to think he's probably like 24 now or something. Probably. <laughs> um, and it all worked out in the end. But that was certainly one of those moments where I thought like, I got to really like 
this is what, what like wow like this is a moment i have to really like think about what i'm doing and make sure that this is not only what i want to do but that i am doing it right that i have uh, what's the word you still need to have compassion for the yeah that there is it's compassion, not just about right. filing a story getting, or getting the shot the story. But it's always right, right. and it, I, it's ever since then it's been about this balance between getting the shot and also being human you know and it's a tricky compassion. balance it really is and that brings in that chameleon comment yes. that you made early on is you need to be comfortable in those uncomfortable scenarios respectful obviously when you're in a situation like that for baby story and I was I did uh, runway moms which was about models who I can't even remember I think it was models who were high risk pregnancies and so I've oh, been wow. in the rooms too right but <laughs> You know, you have to be sensitive to what's going on, but you also have to have the nurses and the doctors and any the PR person, especially, they need to be on your team as well. So you have to have this yes. fine line where they're yes. walking and have a balance yeah. of being compassionate yeah. and also knowing what is your mission there. Right. Your mission is to tell a story. Right. But that story can unfold in so many different ways. And respectfully, if something happens, we may create a story that comes out a little differently than we thought we were doing on the way in. Right. Yeah. I mean, I think in the end, to me, the balance always shifts to being human mm -hmm. over being a producer. But it's, it's hard. It can be hard. There's a gray area really, there. Really hard. Mm -hmm. So you leave Banyan. Mm hmm. And you leave me and Barb and all your lovely friends and your mom. Such a and hard you decide, decision. Oh, you decide to move to LA. Such a hard decision. I mean, it's such a hard decision. It really was not an easy decision. It was a couple years thinking about it. Rob and I both being in the business, we both knew that if we our careers, we wanted to do more and broaden our, our what we were doing. Um, we didn't have a uh, child uh, plans for having children. So we thought, well, we have we need to do New York or L.A. And frankly, the weather's better here. <laughs> so we we went we 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 said, you know what, let's go to L.A. We'll go for two weeks. We'll try to interview everywhere we possibly can. And um if you get a, if he gets a job, uh, you know, I'll go. If I get a job, he'll go. You know, one of us needs a job and then we'll go. So Did you we, preset interviews when you went out? We there had for preset. Those two we had a few. Yeah, we had three or four preset interviews. And then, of course, when we got here, we, we you know, tried even more. But yeah, we had a pre, we had definitely had preset interviews. And um, back to Barb Alfano. This is another crazy thing. There was a woman that worked on ba on Wedding Story, Sean Visco. Sean Visco. Sean Visco, right? She, at some point, had gotten on a field producer call list or something at Dr. Phil. And when I was telling Barbara that I was interested in, in going to, uh, moving to LA and, and doing, oh, actually, I was just interested in doing more television. Um, I had gotten a contact, Sean Visco gave me a contact, said, here's my contact at Dr. Phil. Um, maybe you can get on their field field list, field producer. This list. was after she left Banyan. I, I guess Sean was so. at Banyan. I guess, yes, I think yeah. she had left Banyan and she was back in New York. Right. And so for about six months prior to going to LA myself, um, I got calls from the Dr. Phil show wanting to know if I could do a field shoot for them in Pennsylvania because they shot all around the world, all around the country. And so um, they would call me like normally the night before and say, can you be in Scranton and, you know, 10 a.m.? Um, or I remember Pittsburgh, those calls. Or in Pittsburgh, <laughs> yeah. Or in Pittsburgh. You know, can or you can you be on a flight in three yeah. hours and right. fly to Tampa? Right. But the biggest thing is like the concept of time because they, uh, that's true. I don't know if it's Scranton, but they literally be like, can you be in Pittsburgh in the morning? And I'm like, it's like a five hour drive. <laughs> like right. it's 10 o'clock at night. Yeah. So I never was able to do, and I was always working at Banyan. So I, I could never actually do the shoots, but I had the contact name. So when I came to LA, uh, I looked up my contact. I said, hey, I'm in LA. Um, just, you know, want to stop by and say, hey. And they luckily said, sure, gave me a drive on to the lot at Paramount with Dr. Phil filmed. Amazing. And um, I went in and met them. And I explained to them that they, uh, you know, that I was 
planning on moving out here. And they said, oh, you're planning on moving out here? Oh, well, that's different. That changes things. We actually have a staff position opened out here. And I was like, what? You know? And so I said, this is crazy. And they said, well, we couldn't just, you know, hire you without, you know, trying you out. I said, well, of course not. (laughs) And um, while I was living in this hotel for two weeks, they sent me on a shoot. My first shoot for them was a wedding (laughs) convention. Oh my gosh. At the <laughs> at the Long Beach Convention Center, I drove down there. I remember I got totally lost in in Long Beach, and I drove down there and uh, met the crew and did this, uh, you know, man on the street kind of stuff, and you know, did B roll and then inside the thing, and and you know, and send it back to them, and and went on my way, went back to Philly, and um, stayed in contact. And they said, well, you know, the shoot went well, blah blah blah, but you know. We're not still not sure. So you need to come out. And I said, listen, I got a job. I got to let them know like a month notice. I, you know, so they said, well, you know, we're not going to, con- you know, we're not going to commit totally, but why don't you come out and do a month? Okay. So that was a leap of faith. Cause I, yeah. I didn't have a full contract, but I thought, you know, I'm, I think, I think I can do this. So uh, Rob stayed back in uh, Pennsylvania and I moved I here by myself. That. I flew here and stayed in a, a little, you know, furnished apartment for two months and uh, my, the, the week of uh, Halloween and uh, 2004 and 2003, 2003. And uh, I started working at Dr. Phil and as the you rest know, I history. worked on and off for Dr. Phil for 20 years, <laughs> 20 years. It's, like, <laughs> it's just mind boggling. Yeah. yeah. Before I get to the t- talk about those 20 years, when did you get your DGA? Okay, so I know because I saw did you need list. to have a DGA in so, order to become? An, so employee? it's one of those funny catch twenty twos where it's like you can't have a DGA job without being in the DGA, but you can't get it. You know, you can't be in the DGA without having it. It's this and weird. Thing. The credits, right? So in that case, in this case, they literally it was just simply I had to join the DGA if I wanted to take this segment director position. That's it. I just had to join the DGA. They had a contract with the, you know, the DGA had a contract with the show, and I had to join, which meant basically I, I just had to pay a few thousand dollars, not just, but I had to pay a few thousand dollars, and um, I joined the union. And it's uh, so amazing, though, because now, you know, you're a DGA. uh, Yeah, little did I know at the time that that type of uh, contract that the DGA has, which is technically called a single camera remote contract, is an unbelievably rare, rare thing. There's only a few other shows like Entertainment Tonight and things that have that contract. Yeah. Um, a very rare thing to find it in unscripted. I don't even know if it exists anymore, really. Yeah, there are. I mean, of like uh, the said, grandfathered yeah. shows, definitely. Right. But yeah, the, the new shows, shows coming out, yeah, they're hiring no. producers that are not part That's of the producers. A whole other podcast show. again, but yes, yeah. the DGA was not uh, positioned itself well to get into the unscripted reality market. How do you think that's altered your career path? Has it at all? Well. I certainly, you know, it, within a few, well, actually in a few years, um, I, don't, I don't know. That's a, that's a broad question. I, I mean, I will say that I certainly kept coming back to the show because um, I would leave and come back and leave and come back um, because of the um, the benefits that the, being, a, you know, in a guild job has. Mostly healthcare um, right. benefits and, and pension benefits. Um, and I, so, and as my career went on and on and I would leave for three months to do another show and then come back more and more, it became more and more obvious that, um, there was nothing like this, uh, connection. Uh, there's well, nothing. Also, when you say that you left, I'm, I apologize for interrupting, but when you say that you left, I just want to clarify, you guys would go on hiatus for a period of time and you would, well, you know, or, or uh, you honestly, would leave and come back. I actually, yeah, it was a nine month on, three month off general job. Generally, I did work some summers for Dr. Phil, but um, but when I talk about leaving, no, I, I did. Uh, so I did do some summer projects, but um, after five years there, I five years there was a long time <laughs> to 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 not have a life, to work weekends, to work nights, to all that kind of stuff. Um, and Your I got hours the opportunity. Were crazy. Crazy, yeah, crazy our hours, hours were crazy. And uh, so my work-life balance was way off. And I got a, 
opportunity to work at Disney at the studio. So I left for three years. Um, and then I came back. And then when I came back, I didn't want to stay, be on staff because I wanted to always look for other things. So for another eight years, I purposely just kind of worked a few months and then worked on other shows and stuff. Um, and then just maybe the last three years, I worked back full or four years, I worked back full time. But I was always my those... it was always my go to job. Right. It was always right. luckily I, I had known enough people there that I knew the door was always slightly open. Um, right. So like relationships. Yeah. Relationship are very strong. Yes. There. Yeah. And. I, I want to just say that all of those jobs and all of the shows that you did for Dr. Phil over those 20 years and how many seasons, um, how many seasons was that show on the air? Because it just went on. It was right? on for 21. So I started uh, season two and uh, I wrapped in season 21. Yeah. And, and while you were there, you wore a lot of hats. I mean, you were out in the field doing some knock and shock and reporting and you were, uh, you know, you were in the booth, you were, you know, creating the stories, you were overseeing posts. Talk about the different hats and the roles that you actually filled while you were on staff. Yeah. Um, yeah, I agree. It wasn't as siloed as things are probably now, which is, I mean, in, in, in our business now. Um, there was a lot of overreach and people were fine with that. It was collaborative, whether your title was whatever it was. Hey, you know, if, if you needed to go get the bagels, that's what you needed to do. You needed to book right. the expert, you book the expert. Um, so, um, I mean, I would say my generally though, my role was as a segment director was to go out in the field, to fly to people's homes, to have them tell their story to me on camera before they actually came and sat on the stage with Dr. Phil, but that morphed. Of course, into sure many, did. many things. They would, sometimes they would say, we want to put you in a plane and we have a catfish story and we need for you to do door knocks in a small town in Mississippi and just you just go. And I'm like, what do you mean just me? And they're like, well, <laughs> you're going to be with the camera. And I'm like, well, what, like I'm on camera? <laughs> they're like, what are you talking about? And they're like, oh, I guess so. I'm like, I guess so. Who are you? So, you know, then it was me with a camera guy being like knocking on doors and um, so yeah, you, you know, um, sometimes there'd be guests who would just be so attached to me and they wouldn't go on stage without having me hold their hand. So and then I'm there, you, there I am sitting in, you know, uh, on the set of Dr. Phil, but for the most part, <clears throat> my role was all about preparing all of the tape package footage that would then roll into, uh, the, the taping, um, in the morning. Yeah. And I was in, in I would be, uh, have the responsibility for one, one show a week, basically. Which was a lot because you were turning them pretty quickly. Yeah. So in those 20 years, um, the stories that you told, there's some were so emotionally draining and how, oh, emotionally to me, draining. the challenge yeah. would also be, how do you keep a show like that fresh? You know, in yeah. 20 years, I know that you guys built a house and you had people coming into the house. And yeah, I mean, it's it's it, yeah. Every year before we started the season, the executive producer uh, would get together. Her name is Carla Pennington and she's amazing. She would get the team together, the whole, you know, the staff together. And she would say, We're, we want to do this differently. You know, we want to do this differently. What can we do? And she, we would pitch ideas about how we can change up the storytelling, how we can change up even how the guests are sitting in the, in the, in the, um, in the, in the studio. Um, and we would, we would shift, we would change that. Sometimes we do more news stories and we'd have news packages. Sometimes we went to more ex experts. Sometimes they, they went through a couple years, which was really hard on us where they wanted all behind the scenes. So then on the, the morning of the show, when all everything's happening and you're kind of getting the guests ready to be on stage, we had a camera following us. So not only had we been up for two or three hours, I mean, uh, you know, uh, up for two or three days, I was gonna say, not hours. Crazy, but right now we need to, you know, dress up like we're, you know, like we're going for a job interview and be followed around with the camera telling them what we were doing. So those were really, um, those were tough, but yeah, we were always, we were always trying to find ways of, and of course, you know, you look at trends, you look at what shows um, that had previously aired that were, you know, that rated well um and then how can we do more of those types of stories there was a lot of that going on too but it was always we were always constantly thinking and i that that really um 
that really kept all of us on our toes. I have to admit, we never. And I, I definitely think it, it it was one of the main reasons that there was such a longevity to that show. And I yeah. do think a lot of other talk shows have taken some of the methods and storytelling that you did on that show, you and all the different teams, because you were broken sure. into teams, right? For sure. Um, Not to and, mention and just bringing mental health kind of to the forefront of, you know, talking about who's away and, and talking about it. So, right. You guys got away from the Jerry Springer, people throwing chairs at each other, and you were really seriously taking a look at the impact of mental health on people. And right. what I do like, and and you graciously, I think, uh, brought me into the fold and I would go out and do these stories. And some of them were much harder than others, you know, and you know that. Mm -hmm. um, but what I, what I really felt was his legacy is that he really did help people. It wasn't just a lot of lip service. He sent people away for drug rehab or whatever it is. There were so many different things. And even, you know, shows that I worked on that morphed into two episodes or whatever, where we went for one reason and then you guys all figured out and, and Dr. Phil figured out, well, this person really needs serious help. It wasn't just about what we originally yeah. thought. Yeah. I mean, and it was, yes. And you, and you're a hundred percent right. We, we, we were uh, helping people. Um, and I think the more interesting part that I've, that uh, Dr. Phil had always talked to us about as a staff is he always, he said, honestly, the people that we are affecting or, 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 or the most are people we will never know people we will never meet. It's the ones that are watching at home to say, aha, uh -huh, I have a 14 year old daughter who has these issues too. This is what right. I need to do with her. Or I have a, a stepmother that, you know, is nagging me. This is what I need to do to, you know? So, um, yeah. So I like to think that, uh, I mean, certainly we didn't always help everybody. Yeah. Um, we tried, but we, well, um, but I, I think it, like I said, I think it was more about opening up a broad conversation about mental health in the country and, 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 and a countries. lot of other things, sexuality. <laughs> right. I mean, there were so many things, um, that in the past may have been taboo topics. Yes. yes. Uh, but I think it was done in a way that wasn't sensationalized when you're, when you're talking about our business in general. Yeah. The yeah. work that we do does permeate all areas of people's lives and we don't even realize it. Yeah. You know, we have to stop and pinch ourselves to be like, wait, wow, I was at this moment in this, which for that person was the, probably the most, one of the three most amazing days of their life or most. And for me, it's just, uh, it's a Tuesday. <laughs> yeah. Right. Right. <laughs> right. But to your and, point, and, and, and I hold that graciously. I, I I feel privileged that I have been able to be in these people's lives and share their weddings and their births and their reunions and their, you know, uh, uh, it's just an incredible that so um, many I've been allowed to be into those. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we've been exposed to things that we never would have been exposed to, and I don't mean you know necessarily. I don't mean a bad way or a good way. I just no, mean in general knowledge, the opportunities yeah. that we've had for travel around the world. I've been to every state, you know, in the, in, you know, all 50 states and have probably filmed in two thirds of them. Yeah. Amazing. Yeah. So uh, when we talk about the Dr. Phil show and it might be difficult because it's 20 years, is there one particular show that stands out for you as being one that affected your life more uh you know we were talking about what 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 work are you most proud of but uh, that's that would include like your entire career but i'm just focusing on on the dr phil show because you did wear a lot of hats and had so many stories that you've worked on There's i mean every single one in a weird yeah. way right so yeah. that's what's so hard is every single story and it you know if you don't have an example it doesn't mean anything but um um we did a story i haven't thought about this in a while we did a story about these four kids in like indiana or something that were bored after school 
and they broke into their neighbor's house and they were just messing around as far as I know they were just messing around and but they didn't realize he was home and he came down the stairs guns a blazing yikes shot and killed one of them oh my god and injured the other and actually I think there was five so there was yeah five and then so the the there was four and um they all went, they were all, you know, they were 15, 16, 17. And it was a stand your ground law uh, state. So all four of these kids were sentenced to, they had terrible, uh, you know, they, they, they didn't have any money. So they had terrible defense attorneys and all that. And they all got life in prison. Because if one person dies, that's considered manslaughter. And then the, if that's the highest, that's the, the highest crime, then you all get the, you know, you kind of all get the same set, the same. Wow. And I, you know, and, and I just remember, and we had them on, we had live, you know, we were talking to them live, uh, live from, from jail, from prison. And I just remember thinking, wow, like, First of all, it's just terrible that, you know, these kids' lives can be ruined um, again about- And they lost a friend. As they, yeah, they lost a friend. They, you know, they didn't have the privilege to have good attorneys. And, um, you know, you can only get, and one of the things Dr. Phil would always say, you can, your attorney can only be as good as you can afford. I mean, it's true. And just the inequalities in the system. And um, we spent a lot of time trying to get that case retried and appealed. Um, so things like that, that really just kind of took this, and we had their, all of their mothers on, of course, and, you know, their mothers see, and I just, it was just one of these moments where it just really made me realize that, um, you know, that we have so much inequality in our, in our system. Um, and, and perhaps maybe there's something, you know, we can do about it, you know, or at the very least, let's talk about this. Let's talk about the fact that there's these stand your ground laws and, you know, 20 X states. And what does this mean? And, you know, so it became part of the national conversation, I think on that a bit. Um, that's just one that kind of rings true. Um, yeah. there's certainly a lot of other ones where, um, oh, I'm sure, you know, I would just sit crying with guests and, and, and things that were, you know, hard, hard to, to take. Um, but every, honestly, every show there was, there was a human, there's always a human comp component. Of course. Um, even you a weight loss show where somebody's lost all this weight and they're so excited and their life is transformed. I mean, right. you're, um, but certainly the ones, the stories were, it, it was a personal human story, but then kind of opened up a broader conversation about where things are in our society were the ones that intrigued me the most. There are so many stories that came off of, out of that show, you know, yeah. that really touched upon some serious issues. And yeah, uh, yeah. I think that you all did an amazing job and did impact so many lives. Now you left Dr. Phil, Dr. Phil's no longer shooting, which is why. Right. Not... I mean, I didn't leave Dr. Phil, Dr. Phil's right. uh, show uh, uh, is uh, after 21 seasons, he decided to uh, not to do his daytime show, a syndicated show. Um, he is uh, doing some other things uh, and should pop up, you know, in the next few months. We were somewhat prepared, you know, we had several months of knowledge and we had a feeling that eventually he was going to retire the show. Right. Uh, right. We were lucky to be there as long as we were. And, um, uh, but yes, it is definitely as a friend of mine, who's a, a DP on the show said to me the other night, he said, it's a reset. We're all yeah. resetting. And I felt, oh exactly. my God, that's exactly what I feel like. I have to reset <laughs> my life. How many people were on staff there? When you say we all have to reset, it was like a hundred and some people, right? There was at least 250 people on payroll. At least. It could have been up to 300. And I don't know the exact number, but I'm going to say in that 200 to 50 to 300 people. And a lot of us a lot of us have been there 15 plus years. I mean, a lot, a lot of us. Yeah. Amazing. Yeah. So it was so, a family, you know, it was a family. I mean, most of your life will last 21 years, right? So true. And you have lifelong relationships now, you know, that, that you've made. So when we look at, at, at the production industry today, it's yeah. changed. The landscape has changed, right? There are more opportunities to get content out there. And now 
these 250, 300 people along with yourself and, and myself and a lot of other people as content creators and storytellers, we are left trying to figure out what's the best method to get our content on the air. Do we own our own content? Do we pitch to a network? Do we go the streaming route? How do you see the landscape changing and affecting, you know, just the process of even getting into this business? I think yeah. for some, especially younger people coming out of school, which we do speak a lot about giving tips and things, I think they have learned differently than we did. We were more like linear learners and they're yes. learning like all over the place. Yes. Especially with social media and everything. So what is your take on that? Well, I certainly think that, you know, technology is driving, you know, this uh, this uh, change in our distribution, right? So it's all about distribution and access to content. There can be great content, but where are you going to see it? And where's the, you know, where's the vast majority of people going to see it? So, yeah, you definitely see this trend where you used to have, you know, broadcast television and cable and everybody had that. And that's what we had for many, 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 many years. But now, of course, you have streaming channels um, and all these streaming distribution channels so that this is opening up a new world. And like you said, I mean, there's positives and negatives. The positive is there's a lot of content out there. The The negative is, I think, though, that at the end of the day, as you know, most of us know, this is all supported by ad revenue. And right. as ad revenue falls on all of these traditional methods, um, then that starts affecting all the finances on their shows. Um, so it becomes about how can we make a living? How can the shows uh, make a profit? How can the networks make a profit? How can the, you know, and, I, and I'm not going to, uh, you know, for a second think that I'm a, an expert at that, except to say that um, if you are looking for, you know, work, um, you know, if one is in that in that approach, I, I think you should look at all options. You know, you shouldn't say, well, I don't want to work on a streaming thing or I only want to work on streaming or I really want to work for a cable show. I want to, you know, you want to, you know, you want to go out there and just work. Right. Um, you want to work on things that you love, you know, or that, you know, or have your passion and your interest. And I still think the storytelling is still going to drive, you know, the content, you know, it's still going to if it's a great story, uh, you know, I'm going to I'm going to get HBO to see it. You know, if it's a great story, I'm going to, you know, somehow find a way to stream it. If it's a great story, I'm going to, you know, uh, find a way to get to ABC. So, um, you you know, it still starts with having great, great content. But certainly we have, you know, I don't know anybody in Generation Z that has cable or has, a, you know, a dish, you know, has a, sorry, has a uh, an antenna on their, on their roof. So that's just the new reality. I, I agree. I mean, I, I do see it as an opportunity. Right. Oh, yeah. I think yes. rather than having tunnel vision about we we're creators, right? And some of our biggest hurdles were how is our content going to be seen? Where are we going to get it to? Yes. Now you can start your own YouTube channel. Yes. Right. Instagram, right, stories, yes. all kinds of things that yes, people, yes. if your content is strong and valuable. And, and obviously there's content creators that I might not find their content valuable to me, but it, it could be valuable to other people, right? Sure. It, it is in many instances. So I do think it affords people more opportunity. I think yes. it also allows younger people who are just coming out of college, if they do have a strong idea that they can pursue trying to find alternative ways to get their messaging and their story out there. Yeah. It doesn't mean it's going to right. connect, but I do see no, it right. as an opportunity. I also yeah. see it as a challenge. Yeah. If you were to think about all of the skills that you have and you're giving advice to somebody who wants to get in this business or, or you know, pivot in, in their current career or works for a TV station and now they want to go out on their own, what are the three top things that you feel will enable somebody to succeed in this industry? I think the number one thing is to be resourceful. I think regardless, if you want to be an audio person or an engineer, or you want to go into scripted 
you know, sitcoms or you want to do documentaries, whatever it is, you have to be resourceful. You have to think about not only how are you going to get there, you know, uh, but, you know, but what are you going to do when you get there? You have to think about, there's no linear, we don't have that linear road in our business. You know, we, we don't, um, that's the beauty and the curse. We don't have a linear road. We don't have a, you know, a one way to, to get into our business. Um, and so you have to think outside the box, you know, and, and this is, you know, this is for people who want to get in the business is, you know, you have to think outside the box. You have to think, okay, well, just so-and-so, I remember this guy and he worked in the thing and maybe I can call him or, you know, my, 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 whatever. You have to think about who, who can other, other different, yeah, different methods than, you know, uh, you had just have to be resourceful. That's the best way I can. And then once you get the job, you still have to be resource, you know, resource being resourceful is key. Um, I think you also have to be willing. You have to realize that nothing is too small. You, you know, nothing is beneath you. <laughs> you know, if you get a job and all they want you to do is make sure that the, the, the cast member has donuts, you make sure those cast members have donuts, you know, the best way you can. It's really, um, I've hired, p- picked people out of, a, you know, the smallest little job because I thought, oh my God, they have so much dignity and respect of what they're doing. I can count on them to do other things. Um, so when you're just starting out, just, um, just whatever it is that you're doing, maybe it's really, you're just hired to open the door for somebody, whatever, just make sure you open the door at, with a smile, you know, and, and, you know, just be, um, just, don't never think anything's beneath you. I think that is really important. Um, right. Don't walk you know, on set with an attitude. Like, yeah, I d- do yeah. That. Don't even think you're going to even get on the set for three years. You don't think you deserve to get on the show. You know, just be humbled with where you are and do the best damn thing you can do with whatever it is that you were hired to do. And people do notice. I mean, you have to, you know, you have to be out there. You got to be resourceful. But people do notice good people. We do, you know, yeah. we want to, we all want to surround ourselves, right? You know, people who are great at what they do. It makes our job easier, you know, <laughs> you know, if they're great at what they do. Right. So, um, you know, we want to, and I admire that. I, 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 even to this day, I have uh, two right now, two people that I feel like I'm kind of mentoring, you know, that are 23, 24 and the, you know, and I'm, I'm always checking in with them and I'm always, cause I see their passion and I see their dedication. And it, I want to see them succeed, you know, because I see how willing they are to do anything and be happy to, they just want to learn, you know, they just want to soak yep. in. And that's the way I was uh, just because it's the way I am. Um, so that's, that's another point is being like a sponge, right? Is yeah, paying so you just attention to what's it. going on around yeah. you. Yeah. And I'm sure you had that too. There's so much I learned by just watching what people were doing, how they were interviewing, how they were setting up the lights, how they, you know, it, you know, whatever, introduced themselves to a celebrity, whatever the hell it was, you know, like how, 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 so that well, if I ever get that chance, I'm going to do it that way. Yeah. It's that looking, it's that, you know, it's that being perceptive. Yeah. So those would be kind of my, my key my key thing. And then I think once you, you know, for what, what you and I do with interfacing with human interest stories, I think just, ma- you know, making sure you have compassion and thinking about how would I want this person to treat me if I was in their shoes? And that's what I always think about when I'm going into a situation that's maybe a little challenging is I think to myself, if I was that person struggling with whatever it is, how would I want someone to react to me? That's, right. and I come from that place. And normally that's, you know, that gets me there, you know? Well, and I think that's why you've had such an amazing career. I don't think I know because you bring all these traits and these beliefs yeah. with you and you've done a lot of work. I mean, you said Disney earlier, we worked on the uh, American presidents. You worked on a lot of shows for Disney. I, the one that I know that I was really inspired by, which seems crazy is that show you did, um, it was the Civil War. The Curse of Civil War Gold for the History Thank Channel. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> I know it's so crazy because I talk to you about this periodically, but you literally moved away. You left California and you were in Minnesota. I was in Michigan. Michigan, right. Muskegon, I knew we had yeah, an M and Michigan, an I. Western Michigan, Muskegon. Yeah. Like, 
the craziest on gigs. a boat in Lake Michigan with scuba divers. Yeah, crazy. Totally crazy. But you've had these incredible experiences that you've been able to dig into your own, you know, your own bag of tricks, you know, your toolbox, right? And and a lot of times when I'm mentoring uh, younger people, I talk about the importance of not just observing what's going on around them, and but also deciding early on the things that you agree with or that you like, or I would do that and I wouldn't behave that way. You know, when you see a director or a producer or someone uh, treated or a talent treat someone with disrespect, you need to know right away, hey, that is not, that is not okay. Some people may look at that and say, hmm, that's interesting. It gives them the creative license to treat somebody like shit. No, that's not right. really what you're supposed to do. I agree. I agree. You're supposed to treat people with dignity. And I yeah. think having all these experiences has enlightened you and you bring all of those tools in your, in your toolkit to every job that you do. And then you're sharing it by mentoring these young kids, which is which is incredible. Now, I do want to ask you, because we had talked about this briefly, about, you know, uh, what are you most proud of, of the work that you've done? And we talked about Phil, and is it just the actual breadth of work that you've done? Is there one particular thing, or have you not gotten there yet? Like, you're proud <laughs> of everything, but you haven't achieved the ultimate goal that you have for yourself. I kind of well, in terms of that, I'll do the last part first. I I I feel like I'm one of these people that um, I've already been blessed with more than I probably thought I would achieve in my career. So I'm um, humbled by that, and and I'm interested in you know giving giving back and um, um, to people um, and and continuing my journey. I'm not stopping, but. Um, just continuing, uh, just, just rest, rest in, in knowing that, wow, I've, I've really lucked out here. I worked my ass off. I'm not going to, you know, not say I didn't. Um, but I've also, um, you know, been very lucky and privileged. Um, you know, when I think about proudest accomplishments, I didn't really know. I didn't really, I've never really thought about that until very recently. And I got a phone call about two months ago. And I'm going to set this up by going backwards a little bit. I worked for a couple of years for a show for, um, it was called Beyond Scared Straight. I think it was for A&E. And it was a show where we took at-risk youth through a kind of scared straight jail program where they would go and they would meet inmates in county jails all over the country. And the, by meeting I remember these, that show. these, 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 um, these inmates, we hoped that they would, you know, go a different direction than what there were. were. And these were young kids. These were 10, 11, 12, 13 year old kids that were maybe stealing a Twinkies, you know, from the corner store, right? Not bad right. kids. You know, so we would go to town to town and and and, and spend uh, four or five days, you know, we one, one day with their family, one day in the jail. And, and, and this was several years ago. This was uh, maybe eight years ago or something. Um, and so I'm setting it up that way. So I get this call two months ago and my phone rings. I don't know the number. And uh, this woman on the phone, I said, hi, Mary Ann speaking. And the woman says, Mary Ann, how do I know you? And I said, I don't know how you know me. I said, well, I have your name in my phone and it just says Mary Ann. And I wanted to call and figure out how, who, how I knew you and what, and I, and I said, well, I don't know. Where do you live? And they said, I live in Georgia. And I said, do you live in Fulton County? And they said, yes. And I said, well, years ago, I was on a show called, I was a television producer and I'm on a show called Doc, uh, Beyond Scared Straight. And she goes, oh my God, Mary Ann, Mary Ann. And she started screaming into the phone. I know who you are. Oh my God, Brittany, you can come down here for Brittany. And I was like, Brittany, yeah. She goes, oh, Brittany's mom. I was like, oh my God. Hi, blah blah blah. It turns out this woman was the mother of one of the daughters that we dealt with, and I had come to their house, spent a day at their house, and taken Brittany through this program. 
Oh my God, I want to thank you so much. Brittany is amazing. She's 23 now. She has a job. She just had a baby. That turned her life around. I can't thank you enough. Oh my God, I wish I could reach out and hug you, she said. And I just said, oh my, I can't, th you know, is there anything I can do? I said, you, this call is enough. You just <laughs> did it. Honestly. And, and so, and, you know, and, and, and she goes, okay, if Brittany wants to call you, can she call you? I said, yeah, well, Brittany call me, you know? And that's um, amazing. And I, you know, I put, I said goodbye and put the phone down and I said, wow, like shit, you know, like I actually, hopefully not just me, but me being part oh, being part right. of these people who helped get, see this girl, get this girl to a different path in her life that her mother eight or nine years later is like, can't believe, you know, is still thankful that this happened to her daughter. So um, th those, those are the moments I'm most proud of. Those are the moments that I say, like, that's my legacy, you know, right. like I was able to help this person, you know, and it then it makes all that hard work worthwhile, right? Yeah. That it's not just TV because it is just TV, but it's not when you work in our, our type of TV, this is right. real lives. This is not scripted. My most number one question I always get asked when I said, people say, I walk to Dr. Phil is, is it real? Yeah. And I think, oh, honey. <laughs> It would be so much easier if it was fake. <laughs> you know, if we could make this up and make it go the way we want. Right, exactly. If we could script this, boy, would my job have been really easy. Um, yeah, I mean, so uh anyway, so those, yeah, that's that's one of the stories that just had it just happened to me a few months ago. So it was neat. I love that. And and I I've been there. I've received calls from people or I'm sure letters with photographs of them and their children and thanking me. And, you know, it's, it, yes. it does make you feel that because certainly there have been jobs we've done or stories that we had to cover. And I worked in news and production, whatever, sure. where we were like, why am I doing this? This is, yeah. this is I feel dirty. Yeah. Yeah. I feel like, yeah, and, you know, I'm, I just I'm, wasn't comfortable. There were a lot fewer of those than there were. Of, the things of course, but there's really times where you feel like I need to go take a shower. <laughs> right. So when you hear from some of these people and, and you know that you made a difference in their lives, it does, it does. It just gives me it, gratitude. Yeah, it does. And, and yeah. it says, you know what, these 30 years that I've been in this business, it's been well worth it. And of course, you know, I've made really, I have lifelong relationships. I'm just so, so grateful that you were able to carve some time with us. I know we went a little bit long and there we'll do another episode because we have so much to catch up on and talk about. <laughs> Is there anything that you haven't said, uh, a parting word of wisdom or anything uh, that you would want to share with our listeners? I just, no, no, I, I, the only thing, and I think we, we touched on it a little bit with if anybody's listening, who's wants to get into the business and doesn't know where to start is start anywhere, start anywhere. And don't take no for an answer. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Or, or yeah. Give them, yeah. Take it. Don't take no for an answer. Uh, and, um, try another tactic. <laughs> yeah. Try another tactic, offer something up offer to just listen i i want to do this can uh, will you allow me for to just come there and you know hold you know take notes for you you know can can i just come and uh, carry equipment in you know uh, anything to just get going you know don't think well i am in i produced my you know my my you know film at college and i'm this and that and i know every camera in the world that's great honey but, you know, you need to get in the door somehow. So, and once you're in the door, then it's up to you to, you know, keep the door open. But um, uh, just jump in wherever you can jump in and try to, and two or three times often the charm, you know, you'll send an email or make a call and they won't call you back. Call again, give it two weeks, call again. Right. Eventually, somebody will hopefully feel guilty enough to return your call. <laughs> <laughs> well, and, and the other thing that you said that was really important is that we do notice on set in the office who goes the extra mile, who doesn't complain or make a face or, you know, have a chip yep. on their shoulder because you ask them to take the trash out or do something. Yeah. Uh, 
who shows up on time. And a lot of people who I've talked to on the podcast have said, show up early. If you're on time, you're late. Yep. And so these are all little tidbits of, yep. of information and tips that we can share yep. uh, with those people coming up through the ranks. And uh, sure. we certainly have done it ourselves. So we will definitely invite you back, Mav, <laughs> because you're so amazing. I can't wait to see and hear about all your, uh, n- the next chapter of your life and your career. Well, thank you. And thank you again for doing this podcast. I think it's wonderful. I love listening to it. I love hearing and knowing about all of my friends and colleagues I've worked with in the business. It's super fun. I hope you keep it up. And I would uh, totally offer myself up to to do your interview because I think you need one too. You know, even even somebody interviewed Oprah, you know. <laughs> that is true. I am no Oprah, but <laughs> oh hell, girl! Yes, you are. <laughs> um, but I would love that. I, I will. We will schedule that when it fits with your with your time frame. And uh, I am so looking forward to seeing you again in person, so I can actually give you a hug. And um, and we will continue this conversation. So thank you. Ah. It's been really great, and I have learned a lot about you. Things that I did not know. <laughs>